So good morning, everybody. Welcome in this session about engineering education research. Uh, my name is Alder Kamp and I will share this meeting. I'm actually the immediate past director of education in Delft University of Technology. And I've retired since uh, about one year. I'm still the co-director of uh, CDIO and I uh, am still highly involved in the CDIO thinking and attending this conference. So. We have three interesting papers, one from uh, Queen's University Belfast about uh, a reflection on 15 years CDIO implementation. We have uh, one paper from uh, the Urbo Academic University in Finland about the difference between digital education as they did already before COVID and well, what happened in the COVID, was it helpful? And one from uh, Rodrigo Pascual in uh, Chile about flexible tactics, uh, well, actually ab about the emergency uh, and uh, remote education all due to COVID, but also due to social uh, upheaval in, the, in Chile. So I think three interesting papers to see how we have accommodated in the past and right now on change. So may I ask, uh, first of all, uh, ask the host to, uh, put the presentation from uh, Louise Pic uh, from Queen's University around on the screen, please. please. Hello, my name is Louise Pick. Today I'd like to present a paper that my colleagues and I from the School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Queen's University of Belfast have put together. And the paper is called Gauging the Impact of CDIO and Momentum for Further Change. Today I'm going to talk about how we carried out an alumni survey back in 2004, which looked at the skills that graduates needed and the core knowledge that they required. We've now repeated that same survey in 2020, and we're going to look at whether or not there have been changes as a result of CDIO implementation within the school, and whether there are gaps that still need to be filled. CDIO was first introduced into the QUB curriculum in 2004. At this point, a number of innovations were made to try and incorporate the CDIO principles and methodology. For example, we started to use new workspace designs. We introduced more project and problem-based learning, along with more active and interactive learning activities. Back in 2004, there was an alumni survey carried out of graduates both within our school and within a number of other universities in order to try and ratify and define the CDIO syllabus. Since 2010, all the graduates who have finished a programme through our school would have completed a full CDIO based programme. So this study wants to answer the question, is our CDIO based curriculum still fit for purpose compared to the one that was developed back in 2004? And there are many reasons why that may not be the case anymore. The first and most obvious one is the amount of rapid technological change that has occurred in the last 15 or 16 years, with much more increased digitization and automation. We've had very clear societal changes, and we must now focus more heavily on areas such as sustainability, ethics, diversity and inclusion. And of course, we've had the more recent disruption, which has caused wide scale differences in how we work and how we live, caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And when we come to the other side of that, what will the new normal look like? Are we still developing graduate engineers who are equipped with the skills they need to be successful in industry now and into the future? So our aim and methodology was to obtain an up-to-date set of responses from alumni to compare with the 2004 survey. We sent out an identical survey to the one sent back in 2004. This time it was sent by email. We received 89 responses back. This was lower than the 143 that were received in the original survey, but this was in the middle of the COVID-19 lockdowns. So we thought this was a reasonable response rate given the circumstances that we were carrying out the survey in. So then we compared the results 15 years apart and asked how did the alumni rank the importance of subjects now in 2020 compared to 2004? How did they rank the importance of skills? And are there any areas of 
which still need significant improvement or changes. So the first thing I want to present is how the, the alumni rank the importance of various subjects. First of all, looking at mathematical topics. We find that generally there were not any huge differences between 2004 and 2020, but there were some notable increases in perceived importance of areas such as transforms, complex numbers, calculus and vector calculus. And we feel that this may be due to increased need for expertise in areas such as computer programming and modeling. We saw some slight decreases in areas such as traditional mathematical topics such as geometry, trigonometry and algebra. In terms of the core engineering topics, alumni in 2004 and in 2020 had very similar opinions about their importance. They both placed quite high importance on having a good basic knowledge in these topics and there was no real notable change in the perceived importance of understanding the relationships, the variables, or being able to carry out calculations. In terms of additional subjects, we did see a little more change. We saw some increased perceived importance in areas such as electrical and electronic engineering, computer programming skills, and related areas. And again, this is not unexpected and is more likely due to the rapid increase in the use of computer-aided systems in manufacturing, production, research and development. And again, this is all linked to the Industry 4.0 shift. We saw some small decreases in the importance of a variety of business and enterprise skills, but all the other areas remained relatively unchanged. Then we looked at the skills that graduates thought were important. And here you'll see in red the importance that the 2020 graduates placed on these particular skills and in blue you will see the importance that the 2004 graduates placed. They are very similar for most skills but we see a modest but notable increase in all of the conceived design implement and operate areas from 2004 to 2020. We asked the alumni to rank their own skills at graduation. And here we compare the perceived ranking of their own skills of graduates who completed a program before 2010 and after 2010, once there was a full CDIO syllabus in operation. What we can see here is that those who graduated after the CDIO syllabus had been implemented reported much higher self assess skills in a few key areas, particularly in teamwork, leadership and communication skills. Then we saw some increase in design and implementation skills, but we did see some decreases in the area of enterprise and business and in conceiving products and services. So results suggest that some more work is needed in improving some key skill areas. Finally, we asked for a number of free form comments on the alumni and a few themes emerged from this. The first one was in the area of getting good industrial experience. The graduates definitely enjoyed undertaking industrial placements and having industrial visits into the university. And pre-CEIO graduates commented that there was not enough of this in those days. The post-CDIO graduates said that their most useful skills that they had gained were in this area of gaining experience in industry. There were some comments relating to the use of technology, and this seemed to reflect the increased importance placed by alumni on having knowledge in areas such as engineering software, computer programming, and so on. Alumni's experience of teamwork during their degree program was varied. This comment by one particular alumni highlights both positive and negative aspects of teamwork, where they enjoyed it, but they felt that it did have some negative imp implications for their own scores. Finally, alumni commented on the importance of having good professional skills. The technical skills are important, but there are a whole host of other skills that are just as important, if not more, in terms of engineers having good communication skills, being able to network, 
been able to deal with project management um, issues and so on. And that was very clear from the results. So in conclusion, we did not see any major shifts between 2004 and 2020, which is positive in that it gives us confidence that what we are doing still remains relevant. However, there are some key differences that were noted. First of all, we saw some small uplift in the importance placed on areas such as computer programming and electronic engineering. And this seems to be reflective of the higher use of technology generally within industry. We saw some increase in the rating of performance of the core conceive, design, implement, operate skills. If we compare the alumni who graduated before CDIO was implemented and after, their own rating of their skills at graduation have increased somewhat in the areas of teamwork and communication and design skills. But there are some areas where further work needs to be done to improve some other key skills. The comments that were made by a number of respondents gave a very interesting insight from industry and they highlight the need to continue to develop well-rounded engineers who are equipped for the world of work, who have up-to-date technical skills which are supported by industrial acumen and good professional and personal skills. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Louise. So, thanks for the interesting talk and I would like to give some questions. I see Karin, you have a hand up. Is that right? Oh, oh the hands up. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, Jürger, could I give the word to you? Yes, I, I have a question. You had in, in one of these results, it was um, one that was decreased was uh, the understanding of system and something. I don't remember what it was, but generally this systems and, and complete picture, I think, uh, that was a decrease. Do you have... The, that, of course, is one thing that the CDRO had tried to also, I think, increase an understanding of that. But might it also be the reason that that this world is coming so much more complex or sort of we have more complex systems around us that the feeling is just that we understand it worse than it's not the education that has gone in the wrong way. We're just not keeping up with the speed. Is it, What do you think? I think it's not one that I actually noticed, to be honest. Um, I think you're probably right that it is things are more complex, that um, people are having to deal with much more, much more diverse um, roles and activities when they go into industry now. Um, and I think it might be just a perception or it may, I, mean, I don't have an answer uh, <laughs> to your question, but it's a good point and, and it's something to think about. Um, it, it could be what either that or, or the, the increased complexity. I'm not sure, but it's yeah. a good, good question. <laughs> no, but interesting result in general to see this, that how it develops. So I think this would be very nice to have a, a kind of, some kind of global level even that yeah. you could see. I agree. It would be nice to see whether what's reflected, because a lot of our graduates would stay reasonably locally in either Northern Ireland or, or in Great Britain. Um, and it would be interesting to see how, how that's reflected across industry across the world and, and in terms of, you know, the differences in, in the types of companies that we have locally compared to elsewhere. Um, so I think I think it would be good to, to see. I think Charlie yeah. has something to, to add to that. Yeah. yeah, just to re respond, Jürger there, um, again, th th there was a lot of the results that came back, uh, and as Louise has already said, you know, we, we were really focusing in on the, the, the key differentiators, um, spe specifically because of the, the, the number of the return, but in the bigger picture, more uh, holistic view of all of this, you know, for years now at CDIO, um, we've been discussing impact and, you know, we've been trying to explain impact to potential new implementers of CDIO and I was just on the periphery of the first survey in, in 2004 whenever the, the much smaller group of CDIO institutions were trying to verify and validate you know the syllabus and the, the, the standards and, and stuff so this seemed like a, a good idea to us to and it was brought up a couple of years ago in the, in the conference in Aarhus 
uh, at a round table and there seemed to be a lot of buy-in from other uh, CDIO institutions and colleagues that again, anything that we can try and gauge impact. And it, it's, it's actually come quite timely as well at the minute in relation to, you know, even our wider university now starting to ask us, you know, what benefits are you getting out of CDIO? You know, can you give us tangible um, results from this? Because you seem to be spending quite a bit of money on the, the teaching side of things. So th that's timely. But uh, in this, as far as the CDIO community is concerned, you know, we, we, we would love to see these results been farmed out to our, our UK and our, you know, the, the survey even carried out again by universities all around the world to see, especially those that have been involved in CDIO for a significant amount of time to have produced graduates from their, their um, programs. And don't get me wrong, we're not saying, and it might've come across in the paper, you know, that, that our programs are all 100% CDIO perfect. There's nowhere near that. We're still trying to uh, uh, implement CDIO right across the programs and have the perfect integrated curricula. But, uh, as everybody should know by now, that's not an easy thing to do. So again, any impact, any any feedback we can get, and especially from our graduates. And Christina mentioned this at a round table earlier. There, you know, looking for that those professional opinions from the people ha that have actually gone through these programs and are now working in industry is, is vital to us. And we do have an industry uh, forum and stuff like that that meets twice a year. But uh, this has actually backed up uh, some of the, the, the feedback we're getting from our industry board too. So okay. that's where we're at. Thank you, Johnny. I see Rodrigo, you have a question about the, the timing. Can you uh, put a question yeah, uh, forward? Yeah, I can read myself. So uh, uh, <clears throat> I asked myself uh, why this revision only after 16 years? It's like uh, too long period to revise what you're doing. What happened with the continuous improvement process that the framework stimulates? Luis. I think I'll let Charlie, Charlie answer that one. Thanks. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, and we've also our director of education here, Paul Herman, who might want to uh, cut in as well. Um, I mean, we, we have been involved in, you know, uh, evaluating as, as we have to with, with, with this, the standards, you know, our programs. And it's all done in-house. And I think everybody does that. And there's never, uh, well, as we said in the paper, there, there has some of the Scandinavian universities have looked at this in the, in the past, but I, I totally agree with Rodrigo. It, it's something that we should be trying to get a, a gauge on. And it's always the, the, the questions we get from new universities interested in joining CDIO. You know, what do we, what are the other impacts from implementing CDIO, you know, give us numbers, give us something, facts, engineers want facts and numbers. And, and uh, a lot of the times we're going more on our, our, our gut instinct and our feeling and, and our anecdotal information from obviously interviewing our, our graduates and seeing our graduates later on and speaking to our, our industrial forums and whatnot. But uh, we, we were just trying to get a gauge on something tangible and be able to put numbers to this. And it's why we, we repeated almost uh, exactly the, the, the previous uh, questionnaire. It's actually, it's chapter three in, in the CDIO book uh, in relation to how it was done. There was, there was Queens and, and three other universities involved. So it seemed the easiest thing or the most logical thing for us to do was to try and recreate that and see if there were any noticeable differences that would spark, you know, momentum or spark some type of discussion on what to do next or, or maybe be able to even just tell our colleagues and, and, and other CDIO members, you know, what seems to have improved Again, we can't perfectly say this is, you know, working, but it seems to be uh, making a, a difference in the areas that Louise has already uh, emphasized there. Okay, are there any further questions? I have I've a question actually also about uh, to, to what extent do alumni know what exactly, what, what skills and what knowledge they need in the future? Uh, I'm, I'm again, thinking, for instance, about uh, data engineering. I mean, that is not on your list. And I think that is a skill or an, a, a competence that is really urgently needed, needed in the future. But that does not come up, let's say, in the questions that you put to the alumni. No, and again, it's a very good question. And we did have a debate on this beforehand um, in relation to the questionnaire if she would, and if we should change it. But that would be phase two. Uh, and again, I suppose, you know, 
with regard to our alumni being aware of, of stuff like that, I suppose that's our responsibility as, as the teachers and the program um, designers and what we should, as you've mentioned earlier, Elder, and, and other uh, parts of the conference. But again, that's that's phase two, phase three of, of the work okay. and where we might go with us. Any more questions to Louise and the fellows, Paul and Johnny? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Queens, Belfast. So then uh, we go to the next one, and that is uh, the presentation from uh, Jurker. So, host, could you please put the screen and the presentation from Jurker? From digitalized education to COVID 19 restricted education, challenges and differences. Uh, it's authored by Jarke Björkvist, that's me, and Tommy Hämäläinen, Åbo Academy University. It's a university with 7,000 students, and it's a Swedish-speaking university in, in Finland. At our department, we did some digitalization, actually a lot of digitalization work before COVID-19, before we knew anything about this crisis. Why did, did we do this digitalization? We had the issue that we had to deal with increasing number of students, but still with the same faculty size, so no more personnel. And the other big objective was that we wanted to get more uh, real interaction, so more time for real interaction with the students. How we did this uh, a digitalization that we looked for way to automate repetitive tasks for example such as exercise correction that was typically one example of how it was solved by using code grade in model making it's much uh, more fluent for the teacher to 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 uh, check that exercises were done we also did video like recordings of lectures uh, the main objective was here to also provide remote access for uh, students not necessarily present and off, uh, offline with, uh, for example, in the working life. And then we also did some testing of digital learning platforms. All this was done before the COVID-19. Then COVID-19, of course, hit everyone. Uh, we all know that, and from statistics, we, we can also see that this was done in the spring of 2020. 85% uh, of all classes in schools or, and universities were transformed online. 12 of these in that spring were suspended, and then three were cancelled. So ma majority absolutely were simply transferred online. And the same at Obo Academy University from March 13, 2020, everything was uh, uh, transformed online. And since that, basically, most education has been online, also for IT. So the question was now, could we use our previous digitalization efforts when we moved completely online? Here's a uh, short few notes about uh, a general higher education institutes development of education. So we can see in general that we have two uh, major things that we discuss, structural changes and pedagogical design changes. And in general, we see the trend that we go away from what we could call academic education and teaching traditional and go to more active learning and autonomy. So this is a general trend at the same time as this big scale COVID-19 crisis has occurred. And in, in this change, we can have three uh, things that we, we discuss really. So what means what to teach? That is basically the curriculum. Where? where to teach it, that connects to our campuses and learning spaces, and then how to teach it, and how means this pedagogical design. So we have this, we can say in general, three uh, things that we work with. Uh, we did this survey at 2020 and the department that we looked uh, uh, on the fall of a different uh, uh, 
aspects of our education. Here they are listed, I will not go very in detail in that. But some results of that survey said already that time used in grading is an issue. Uh, that was what we tried to handle with the digitalization. Classroom whiteboard are used also online. Uh, that says that people like to be in the normal or teachers want to be in the normal spaces when they teach. Uh, courses doing real hardware were of course do, hard to do. Uh, and group communication tools not so always so easy to use even if we have a lot of them today. So I agree what to use and when to use them and so on. And then we see a general trend that we've seen that bring your own devices that people own laptops so this real for kind of uh, computer classrooms has basically started to disappear quite much we then looked on what did change for example in this that uh, in the uh, grading uh, when it comes before covid and uh, during covid and we can see that we moved more to grading using assignments, grading using projects. And of course, the biggest change was that we have written e exams at home. That has been a major change of grade in, when it comes to COVID 19. Uh, how coursework was changed, have you, we are also checked. Um, and basically, what we can say from that, here are some numbers on that, is that, that uh, so much uh, in the actual coursework not, did not necessarily change due to COVID-19, because we had already made this digitalization efforts. But here we can see a little bit that uh, what kind of coursework were in different uh, of the 37 courses that were analyzed in, in this survey. So then the most important, what changed and what did not change in, in, in this in due to COVID. Uh, continued, the courses basically continued as before. They were only streamed using Zoom. So that was the change that we could immediately go into where which meant that if we talk, take this, what, where and how meant that where changed totally directly. However, this what and how did not initially change almost at all. But quite soon also, this how changed a little bit, or quite much actually, because the classes with normal interaction and discussions, that uh, moved away. So from having the possibility to see people and discuss with them, we had basically no feedback. On, on the education suddenly. And then when going to examination, uh, we also saw that, the, saw that the what, where and how of exams basically changed. We went into online format, we changed what was asked in the, the examination and we did it at home. So basically everything there changed a little bit. How about quality? At this point, it's very hard to say because we basically need statistic and there were so many other changes and, for example, how people in general react to sitting at home. So really to look in the quality of education is, 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 is rather hard to say about. Then the question that after COVID, what do we want to, to uh, uh, get back and what do we want to retain from that? So basically what we definitely want to have, uh, have a new traction on is interaction between teachers and students. Uh, we want to have uh, feedback from the materials and activities that we, we, we have in our teaching. And we want to make classroom dynamics back into inspiring format. So this is what we want to regain traction. Uh, then what we want to keep from COVID-19 is we want to have this group communication going on. We see that virtual communities that handled by universities are good. 
And we also see that very good with online material to support education. This is the thing that we want to regain, uh, retain from COVID-19. And course dynamic, we saw a lot of changes in course dynamics. Basically this that we, we missed the, the verbal communication classroom interaction. So conclusions, digitalization that worked before COVID-19 also worked during COVID-19. But the real reason for doing digitalization to increase the, the interaction discussion, that need not work at all. So what really changed is teaching dynamics and discussion spaces. We want to have these back. Thank you. Good, thank you, Jörger. Who can I give the word for a question about this interesting experience? I think there is one in Nasa. the chat. Yes. Oh, Natha, I see you. Uh, did you have a hand up? No, you didn't. In the, in the chat. Uh, yes, from Rodrigo. Could you? Yeah, there was this question. I can read it. How did you manage cheating during summative assessments? Um, I don't have a direct answer to that. My normal answer to this is that when I, at least this is my, my way of, of, of talking to students. I say normally, if you want to cheat, that's your problem because you, your parents paid for all this. You can either take the advantage of learning something or then you can skip it. Uh, uh, so that's my basic message about that. And uh, cheating normally, you, are, you can do it now, but cheating is you are at some point always caught cheating. So it's a, not a good strategy. Then I don't know how well this works in practice. I know that other teachers have much, much more kind of, uh, let's say, penalizing when it comes to cheating and want really to check it. And so there are different strategies for this. That, for example, that, that uh, cover uh, surveillance during the, the different tasks and so on. But it varies a lot that I can say about, and that's much about the attitude also with the teachers. Okay, thank you for the answer. Any other question to Jörger? Yeah, I, I have a comment more than a question. Regarding okay, Rodrigo. Yeah, it's, it's that we need to certificate that they, they learned, you know? So it's beyond, you know, do you want to learn or not? Or I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's an important answer to, to take care of cheating because we need to certificate learning. It's, we have a we have a, a responsibility, I think. At least I, it's the case in Chile that uh, we don't have a, they don't have an exam by a college of engineering outside the university to prove that they are engineers, let's say. So we at the university have to certificate that they learned that what they have to learn. So. Maybe we have a difference there between cultures. I'm not sure about if, if it's yeah. that or, or something else. Yeah, I think you are you are very right also on this, and 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 it depends on 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 uh, uh, how much. I mean, uh, if some points, I really want also to see that what do they really know, and there are some different there are different ways of seeing that. That if if you see that there's a mismatch between, for example, some some. Uh, 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 assignments that you do and then some kind of other ways of testing. I prefer they always have some kind of, of exam in, in the end. And if you see there's a clear mismatch, then you, st you realize there's something wrong now here. But I don't really normally be very much of police during uh, uh, the, the coursework and assignments as such. And then I also have another attitude that, that uh, it's not cheating or it depends is it cheating or not but for example many times people go into group work even if it's you say that you should be personal work and then you realize they did some group work and what why why did they learn yes because they did a group work they learned in the group and did a common kind of effort which should have been a personal effort and sort of from the learning it's not a bad thing for the kind of uh, evaluation it can be a bad thing 
So at some point, yeah, you need have a system to really verify that this single person, what does he really know at this point from this material? And yeah, that, I see that's still a challenge. And especially when you don't see the persons, so you don't get the feeling about it. I mean, this is what you see. When you see the person, you have that this match with what I have seen this person. If they're online like this, you have no clue actually of who is sitting behind that. And that's very challenging, I agree. And I have no answer for this. Yeah. Right, Ari, I saw you have maybe a comment to uh, Rodriguez's comment. Yes, um, we've had a lot of discussions about this at our, our university, NTNU in, in Trondheim. And the uh, thing is that you, ha you get the biggest problems when you're relying on one final written digital exam. And one final written digital exam is not a good way to check for engineering competence. Taking written exams is not at the core of the matter of engineering competence. That's not something you do once you've left university. So while they are probably necessary to some degree, there are other ways to ensure that they're actually competent enough. And that's mostly along the ways, as Jerker said, are different ways of, of, of the assuring that mostly if there are hand-ins always ask the students to present why they've done what they've done how they've done it explain the calculations and so forth and it's surprisingly easy to do that for a fairly large number of students so that should be driving different assessment formats also we had david bode the australian researcher on on, on uh, assessment and evaluative judgment in for for a keynote a few months ago at a conference here and he, we asked him the same question what do we do about how do we address this and he said that basically first thing is that we should not think that cheating did not happen in the analog normal world even with people going into exam halls, sitting down and taking exams, they're still cheating. Probably not to the degree of possibilities that we have. But I also think that, that Jerker's comment about why would you do this is definitely important to lay the found, foundation for why, do we, why are we at university? So there's no surefire way to, to, to prohibit cheating for anybody who absolutely is intent on trying to do it. But we can shift attitudes and we should do more than one single kind of assessment. So that, that's basically the home messages here. So we re need, really need to rethink it. And hands on heart, is there anybody here who thinks that it's fun to mark written exams? I'd be happy to do it any, any other way, basically. So, <laughs> so there is that to it as well. So I think that the, the, the the pandemic has offered us a highlighting of two things that we do in teaching and learning that we should really should stop doing. One is we should really stop relying on, on, on wholehearted lecturing as, as, as a teaching format. There's so many other things we can do that will actually enhance students' learning in a better way. And the other one is relying on, on, on written final exams. And, and you want comment here about moving to oral exams. Well, I think that we should do that in a much, to a much larger degree. It's very hard, much harder to cheat on an oral exam. Also in this format, even though I have to ascertain that it's Jerker who gave this presentation right now, I have a good reason that it's him. It has his, his photographic likeness and it sounds like him. So I trust that it is him and so forth. So, so moving to oral exams is probably a good idea. You should all know that at the end of the 1700s, a reform was taken in Cambridge about assessment, and all the academic world said that this will forever destroy the integrity of academia and research and learning. And in the late 1700s, they introduced written exams in Cambridge, and they did not like that at all. They claimed that you can only get a true understanding whether somebody understood something if you had an oral exam. So clearly, there's more than way, one way of solving it. That was my comment. So. Maybe the last question. Emmanuel, I saw you had a hand up as well uh, earlier. Do you still have a question? No, no, I just, it was a comment, but it was included in all the comments. I just want to, uh, maybe just what was said about the oral exams. So in my experience in the last year, um, you know, even during lockdowns and whatever, we tried here, 
I mean, both in Switzerland and in Italy, to, you know, if in any way possible, right, uh, do oral examination, even with COVID measures. And I think that was, I mean, just by recognizing that, I mean, the opportunity for massive cheating, you know, is otherwise uh, immense. And it's not about feeling bad, of course, everybody cheats, but it's about what uh, I think uh, Mr. Pasquale uh, said. Uh, you know, at some point, there is an expectation here in society that you are actually certifying something, right? And so, uh, right, everything has already been said. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you very much. Then, then, Ryder, did you ever wanted to have a final word or did I see a wrong hand up? That was just a thumbs up. Okay, thumbs up. Okay, good. Thank you. Then we jump over to uh, the next, uh, the final paper, which is from uh, Rodrigo Pascual. So, host, could you please present Rodrigo's presentation? Hello, everyone. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Rodrigo Pascual. I'm an academic of the Mechanical Engineering Department at Universidad de Chile. I'm Nicolás Bravo, and I work at the Teaching and Learning Center of the School of Engineering and Science of the Universidad de Chile. For those of you unfamiliar with Chile, we are located closely to the opposite side of the world. Uh, the distance between Hong Kong and Chile and Santiago is close to 18,000 kilometers. As in other cities around the world, such as Hong Kong, Bogota, and Paris, to mention only a few, we have seen in Santiago, and since October 2019, citizen discontent that has led to a social uprising that is an ongoing process. Since the beginning of 2020, we are just as the rest of the world facing the COVID-19 pandemic. The combination of these two crises has led us to a long period of emergency remote teaching and learning with high level of stress and anxiety for everyone. Most of, of the faculty at the School of Engineering of Universidad de Chile did not know how to teach online. Zero or close to zero experience. We needed to learn fast, so we said, let's document our learning process in a conference paper with, that we are presenting today. We checked the literature the best we could, and we came up with three research questions. The first one is, which teaching learning frameworks are better adapted for online learning? Second, how to help our students cope with the term in the context of general adversity? And finally, how to assess learning properly in online learning without overloading our students? Before the pandemic, we had been working with the 21st Century Skills Framework of Charles Fadel and Bernard Trilling. We think that such a framework can be levered in these times of uncertainty. But we also found some theories that are well suited for online learning. For time reasons, we will only mention them. One is the transactional distance theory by Michael Moore. The other one is Communities of Inquire by Randy Garrison and, and, and his team. And finally, a classic, the social cognitive theory proposed by Bandura. To summarize, we, uh, in the title, we talk about tactics. These are the main pillars of our tactics for, for 2020. Active learning, frequent monitoring, and using synchronous assessment with the students. Well, uh, our case study considers a compuls compulsory course placed during the fifth year of the mechanical engineering curriculum at Universidad de Chile. 
At the end of the course uh, called, called Operations Management, the student must be able to engineer proposals to improve operations in the context of public, public and private organizations. For brevity, we consider the transactional distance theory, which uh, advocates uh, reducing this transactional distance that is not necessarily geographical by increasing dial dialogue and autonomy and decreasing stru structure. The transactional distance may be decomposing four dimensions. Uh, we have here student content, student teacher, student student, and student technology. Where, when we evaluate evaluated the transactional distance with our students, we can see here that this distance is relatively short for most of the dimensions. But in spring 2020, the teacher dimension was, was the worst. And because of that, a series of alternatives were tested, tested to face this and reduce transactional distance that we can see in this, in this slide. In letter A, we see the tra traditional appro approach of teaching students the theory or content of the course, but in this case, it uh, was reduced to use only 10 minutes. And in letter E, we have the so-called Olympics, where students collaborate in small groups to resolve challenging problems. And in letter F, we have the champion approach, in which students take control of the class by sharing his or her screen and develops in collaboration with her peers and the teacher uh, a proposed problem. Uh, the three, uh, three evaluations were made with flexible dates. Each one took two hours, as you can see, with two questions from a pool. Questions were posted in sequential rounds, one per hour with a 10 minute break in between. And a third optative question was offered during the next week. And if the student used this option, he or she selected which two questions had to be considered for grade. This was the system of evaluation. The results were good in general, as you can see here in those graphics. Our score scale goes from one to seven, and you can clearly see how the distribution goes to, to the right. And during this online concept, no, no students have failed the, the course. Uh, attendance to online classes uh, was an issue. You can see in this graphic that it fell to about 20% on average after the first partial exam. We had to several strikes during the term and breaks to reduce stress and anxiety. We noticed too um, a lack of dedication to the course on, on average by, by the, the students of the course. Just 33% dedicate more than five hours to the course. And we have that the weekly course dedication must be around nine or 10 hours to, to this course by program. So there was lights of a lack of self-regulation in, in the students. We can see in this graphic that the course was overall well received. More than 75% of the students mentioned that the active learning modality was better for them than a traditional lecture course. Uh, we made two several other questions to the students in a scale that goes from strongly disagree to strong, strongly agree. In this case, the darker responses, the better, and we can see it played uh, rel relatively well. Uh, for uh, <clears throat> for some part, the workload the workload was not a big issue. Just about twenty percent of students considered that it was not easy to handle. A big part of the students recognized that they wasn't attending to classes at the final part of the semester because they had to take care of other courses. That's a common phenomenon in, in the school. And in this occasion, students felt closer to the teacher. They felt he took care of their learning. They received them on the amount of feedback they wanted. And finally, we have that the optional question helped them to better gain the knowledge and competencies of the course and help them to have better marks. Uh, we can see here in this other graphic, uh, we can see some detail of the course competence that students gain through the term. You can see that the difference between pre and post uh, survey are, are positive, better in terms of optimization, communication, writing, and IT tool skills. Um, these are the responses of the students that we extracted from dif different surveys. I'm going to give you now a few seconds to read, to read these quotes. We can see that the students, students valued the online modality and synchronous evaluation did not have major complication. 
um, the stress of the evaluation decreased and when this, once the students felt more adapted given the several instances they had to, to practice. And I'm gonna give you two here a few seconds to, to read. Well, you, you can see here that flexibility was mentioned as a strong point of the course. Uh, and of course, um, of course, the optional question and the fact that turning on the camera was not required after the first evaluation uh, were elements that helped to decrease effectively stress and, and anxiety. So to end our presentation, we consider that the tactics we implemented were successful. We say this as the students achieved the learning goals of the course, were satisfied with the approach we used for emergency remote teaching and learning. Well, synchronous assessment did not generate major pushbacks as you can watch in the, this presentation. Frequent monitoring was helpful to reduce transactional distance too. And the use of this transactional distance framework helped guiding the, the whole process. So this was uh, our presentation and thank you very much for, for watching. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Okay, thank you. It was the final presentation about crisis and pandemic all together. So, who can I give the word for a question to Rodriguez or Nicolas? Karin, can I give the word to you? <laughs> yes, I was just wondering, you mentioned during your talk uh, that the, the students could pick their own question for marking. I'm not sure I, I got that. Maybe you could explain that a little bit further. You had two questions and then the students were able to pick one of them for marking, as I understood. Yeah, yeah, is, that, yeah. is that right? We, we have two days for the for each uh, assessment. During the first day, they answered two questions from a pool. Okay, they had a ten minutes break in in between those two questions. But if they felt that they didn't do well, they could do another question the next week. So and they could eliminate the worst uh, answer from the previous. Uh, from the first two questions. So we gave them an opportunity to improve and it's based on mastery learning. You know, it's uh, giving them several opportunities. In our case, it was only one opportunity, but it helped a lot to reduce anxiety. We felt, and we, you know, uh, as the presentation shows, we, we had several surveys, not, uh, not by the school, but from us, from Nicolas, from me, from, from Catalina, to measure the anxiety, the stress, because here in Chile, if anywhere around the world it was difficult, or it is difficult to manage the, the pandemic, here it was extra because we had the uprising that started three months, no, six months before the, the pandemic. So it was crazy. And we had two breaks during the term, we didn't know if we were going to finish the term. It was very uh, volatile times, but in general, all the country managed to handle the situation, I think. That was, do you that actually was, say that, do you actually yeah. say that you more or less compromised, let's say the, uh, the assessment for the well-being of the students? No, 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 the, the, the difficulty yeah. were the same but I, we, we gave them another opportunity. That's all. Okay. And to avoid cheating, the pool was one question for two students. So I had, I had to prepare a lot of questions, but I didn't want them to cheat because it's something that I believe uh, they, they, they will do if they have the opportunity. Not all of them, but I imagine half of them. Maybe I'm so wrong, but uh, you know, th this is the real world. <laughs> yeah. So that was my strategy. Do we have other questions to? Uh... Yeah, I, I have one. Yeah, please. I, as, as you said, there is a, both a student and teacher as a hour or that 
uh, because they are online lectures. Right? There's a lot of workload on board. How, how can you manage uh, about the workload? I didn't get your question really well. May you repeat it or? I didn't get it. The, the, the audio is not so well here. I think it is about the, the workload that uh, both on the, the online teaching and the, uh, the assessment that gives you additional workload for the teachers. And how did you manage that? I think that's the question. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So th if that's the question, I, I felt we had to do it. You know, we needed to go ahead with the term and be there for the students. It's, it's, it was difficult times, it, they, they are still. But uh, if you're a teacher, you have to take care of your students and get them to learn, I think. So we did the, the extra work we, we had to do. And the course is not so large. You know, it's, it was 24 students uh, for the first term of the 2020. So it's not a large course. It's not 70 or 100. It's 20, 25. So it's OK. It's, I, I, I managed to do it. I would like. I would love to know about how do you do with large courses. So that's that's something that I'm curious about. Hmm? Karin, do you have another question? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, thinking about writers' uh, comments uh, on the other uh, presentation. What, did you do written uh, assessment or, or was it oral exams or how 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 were your uh, your yeah. assessments? The course is very practical because they have to, to solve problems in Excel, in operations management. So, so it was a case study that they needed to develop on their own and they had 70 minutes to answer and they have to write, a, write down a report, small report, a half page report, but mainly it's about developing a problem in Excel. So it's, it's a mix between reading and you know doing the the problem in the tool that we you will use when you will be working. Maybe it's interesting to 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 mention that the the framework of uh, the the rainbow of Trilling and Fadel for the twenty first century skills that guided us regarding what to teach. You know, in terms of uh, improving their communication skills, improving their uh, technology skills regarding Excel, which is a practical tool that all engineers use. So we mix it up uh, uh, between the, the, that rainbow and the transactional distance theory. Uh, why? Because we think that taking care of the relationship between peers, the students, it's important to uh, gain a warm climate in the class, to make them feel that they are not alone. Uh, also with me, let's say, when I move the, the exam from day A to day B, because they are in high pressure, I am showing empathy for them and I'm reducing the transactional distance. So that was a good theory for us to what do we need to do to improve the course? You know, uh, reduce the transactional distance with the technology, Zoom, Excel, whatever we need. Socrates we use as well, Kahoot also. Uh, the distance between the student and the teacher, the students, the distance between students, and finally with the content by using all the time practical cases. Very, the course is very practical. No, it's not very really theoretical. It's really about solving problems which appear in operations. Okay, thank you. There's maybe you. time for one final question, if there is any. And I have a comment the, on that. Okay, Raider, you are the last one. Yeah, <laughs> just come, just just adding adding to what I said previously and to what you said now. One way, of, when once you have written exams, however you else you design the, the the assessment task, it is possible to create several equally difficult 
tasks, and then you randomize which student gets which task. And you also randomize in which order tasks are given. And then you add on that you create questions that requires the students to come up with motivations and arguments on what the answer means. This will necessarily lead to an increase in workload for those who want to cheat, but retains the workload for honest student and teacher alike. So I'm just posting that in the chat as a suggestion. Um, in combination with looking out for oral examinations, oral assessments, and, and other assessment methods, it, it's quite powerful, actually. And then also to repeat and reiterate what Jerker said before, who are you cheating when you're cheating? I think that kind of discussion needs to go on quite much earlier in our education. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody uh, for uh, participation in this uh, interesting session. Let's take a short break and we see each other in 10, uh, I think 10 minutes past uh, the, the hour, we see each other at the keynote. So thank you very much. And thanks also for the host for excellent work. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye.